Modern man has this deep craving to create life. But in his pursuit of designing a new species, unlike God who instructed early man to live within set boundaries to protect him from falling into out of control anarchy, man will leave his creation to believe that all is relative. This is just a body. It's not bad or good. That part's up to you. There is no record to date of the narrator's knowledge that the ancients attempted to create life, though attempts could have been made. But as man excavates the remains of his early forebears, he continues to learn how man viewed himself and his surroundings. The Welcome Collection is situated on Euston Road in London, England, and you can get a picture of what different cultures believed. There is a shrunken head of the sure people of South America. The mouth is tied with string with the belief that it blocks the dead man's spirit from coming out. There is a naturally preserved mummy of a man from the Chimu people of Peru in South America. Peru have the oldest known mummies on earth, maybe with the belief that the individuals would get immortality in the afterlife. Other cultures preserved a memory of their leaders in stone, as can be seen by this detailed stone carving from the ancient Middle East in Iraq. The ancient Greeks in Europe also carved detailed caricatures of their heroes and heroines, and the Nigerian culture of Benin in West Africa carved their chief's head in detail in the metal we call today bronze. Today, we capture our memories through modern high definition quality of digital technology, and you can store hours of data with a card that can fit onto your fingertip. Photography was first developed in the 19th century, and it must have been a phenomenon when first introduced to the public. But it opened the door to another invention, one that was introduced by accident, the X-ray, which according to Britain's NHS is a quick and painless procedure commonly used to produce images of the inside of the body. The man who was credited for discovering the X-ray was a German mechanical engineer and physicist, Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen, in 1895, while he was experimenting with beams of electrons inside of a cathode ray ultra vacuum tube. He called his discovery X-rays and showed how it could revolutionize diagnostic medicine, making it possible to photograph organs and bones. An English chemist and X-ray crystallographer by the name of Rosalind Esley Franklin in the early 1950s was to make one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century by solving the three-dimensional arrangement and structure of atoms in a biological molecule that stored inherited traits, data and genetic information. And she captured an image that opened the doors to DNA. This image has been called Photograph 51. In London's King's College in Waterloo, there is a building named after her that is a kind of posthumous homage to this woman for her famous discovery and a 50 minute walk from London's Gloucester Road station. The house where she once lived has a plaque that reads that she was a pioneer of the study of molecular structure, including in DNA. Under a microscopic lens was discovered the blueprint for all life on Earth that is passed down from generation to generation. And inside of our bodies are genetic traces of where we come from that can be obtained from minucial swabs of saliva. This collage of photographs that circulate online is of a father and his son that was taken over a 28 year period. Why are they so identical? And why do they look so similar? According to the US National Library of Medicine, DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is the hereditary material in humans and almost all other organisms. So in almost all organisms, there is a genetic trace of its lineage or where it came from. But today, man is sadly tampering with the DNA of what we put into our mouths. They're called GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Some have labeled it, God, move over. The infamous seed producing company, Monsanto, 
had to pay out a whopping $700 million settlement in 2003 for contamination. And she is still at war with farmers all over the world in her drive to have a complete monopoly over the entire seed industry. But studies are showing that Monsanto and other corporations are splicing or tampering with the DNA of living organisms that is leading to disastrous results, hindering the fertility or sperm flow in both animals and in humans. Where one man boldly told London's Guardian newspaper, we have a hothouse filled with corn plants that make anti-sperm antibodies, said Epicide President Mitch Hine. Though not categorized as a GMO, the narrator does not touch seedless grapes, for they are not natural at all. All fruits should have their natural seeds in them, for it contains its natural DNA. For at the beginning of time, the Holy Scripture records, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself, upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. When the seeds of a plant like the dandelion blows and eventually germinates in the ground, it will carry the DNA of the parent plant it comes from and carry on that genetic blueprint to continue the cycle of life. Many have called this Gregor Mendel's law, but it is not, it is God's law. And these seeds were also a part of the original herbivore diet of every single creature on earth, as well as the grasses that are rich in protein and can easily digest in these animals' stomachs. Hollywood and its eye-catching CGI and its fast-pacing movement would like us all to believe that these early, now extinct reptiles we called dinosaurs were all bloodthirsty carnivores and your average person will believe it without question. But the evidence shows otherwise. The extinct animal that has been labelled Falcaris utahensis, as it was found in Utah in the United States, has been proven to be a herbivore. According to the respected science journal Nature, this early dinosaur was a vegetarian as scientists carefully studied the structure of its teeth. More and more of early dinosaurs are showing up as being early vegetarians, eating the grasses and the herb yielding seed. They discovered an older cousin to the Triceratops in China, and it was shown that it was also a vegetarian, originally a herbivore. An individual purchased the remains of a Triceratops at an auction spending over $942,000. It was also proven to be a vegetarian. As scientists are looking under the microscope to observe the tiny organisms, the evidence always seems to be leaning closer to the creation account in Genesis. Some dinosaur dung was found in India, not the most exciting specimen to be doing research on. But when you're on a search for the origins of life, you'll be amazed at what you discover. Scientists found tiny particles in that early dung and it was discovered that, once again, dinosaurs ate on grass for their food according to Nature magazine. This really shook up the scientific community as they believed that grass evolved after dinosaurs. If they would have only read Genesis, they would not have been in such shock. Scientists are only confirmed Genesis when they tell us that dinosaurs were vegetarians who ate leaves and grasses. And birds did not evolve into dinosaurs. They are two totally separate species. If they had only read Genesis, they would understand when it says, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl or bird of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And as each creature has its own genetic blueprint or kind in its DNA, aquatic or terrestrial, to continue the cycle of life within that dream pool, this is because a divine act clearly declared at the beginning of time 
that, and God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God didn't instruct the lizard to fertilize a bird, though they both lay eggs, it would damage the molecular structure of the DNA. Sadly, man is trying to mix spider's DNA with goat's DNA. That's crazy. Tampering with the genetic pool, going totally contrary to God's natural cycle he put in place for the animal kingdom when he said, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. So DNA, especially in man, on closer microscopic examination, is made up of two helicoidal strands with a base in the center with rungs of a ladder. The two strands are called the double helix, and this was what was seen in photograph 51, which many have called the key in unlocking the secrets of life. Scientific studies have proven that from DNA, all humans are the same. But there are some obvious differences, especially in the different shades of skin color of people all over the world. In 2003, the New York Times did an arbitrary for the late Thomas B. Fitzpatrick, a specialist in skin diseases. Many of his works are still available online in his research on the pigment that gives skin its color. Theomelanin that is attributed to people with light colored skin that tans poorly. You melanin, attributed with darker skinned people whose skin protects them from UV radiation. The late Thomas B. Fitzpatrick was an American dermatologist, often proclaimed as one of the world's leading dermatologists, and has also been called the father of modern academic dermatology. He was professor and chairman of the Department of Dermatology at Harvard Medical School and chief of the Massachusetts General Hospital. He is credited with the discovery and demonstration of human tyrosinase fundamental to the synthesis of melanin and the discovery of melanosome, the basic metabolic unit of melanin synthesis. As a trained dermatologist who specialized in skin disease, in 1975, he introduced the Fitzpatrick skin type, a scale of classifying a person's skin according to how it reacts to sun exposure. It was a scale of one to six, number one ivory, number two beige, number three light brown, number four medium brown, number five dark brown, number six very dark brown. Question, are people's different shades of brown as a result of hemispheric differences? It is not as straightforward as we would like to think it is when we look at our different skin tones and how it reacts to the sun, depending on which geographical region of the world we live in. Those who live higher up in the northern hemisphere tend to be more pale in complexion and lighter skinned, and those under the equator in the southern hemisphere have a darker complexion and have a darker brown skin. This is an Italian man from southern Europe. He is a lot darker than Europeans in the Scandinavian countries. Mediterranean Europeans were always darker than Nordics. Let's look at one example. Crete is the most populous and the largest of the Greek islands in the Mediterranean Sea. It once had a powerful civilization. Though it rose up a little later than Egypt, Babylon and the Indus Valley civilization in Pakistan, India, it was a very sophisticated culture with some extraordinary feats in its architecture alone, where its massive structures made use of light reflection and seismic resistance that protected it like the Great Pyramid of Egypt against earthquakes. They had high pottery technology, a lucrative shipping empire, and like the Indus Valley civilization, a highly sophisticated drainage system where its hydro technology consisted of cisterns and pipes, where the palaces had open terracotta conduits and a highly sophisticated sewage system. From the war paintings, this Cycladic culture were dark-skinned Europeans with a ruddy brown skin tone. One man detailed their complexion 
in a work published in 1920 titled The Outline of History by the late English author Herbert George Wells. And this is how he described them. The Mediterranean or Iberian division of the Caucasian race had a wider range in early times and was of a less specialized and distinctive type than the Nordic. The Mediterranean dark white or Iberian race is still the prevailing race in southern Europe. So the Minoan civilization of ancient Crete had different shades in that European culture. Some were light-skinned and some had a darker reddy brown complexion. According to the Fitzpatrick skin type scale classification, Mediterranean people are under skin type 4 and recent studies of the skeletal remains of the DNA have showed that they have not evolved from some primeval ape-like creature but were anatomical humans and the BBC records that the Minoans are Europeans and are related to present-day Cretans on the maternal side. Now let's look at Africa. The ancient Nubian kingdom of Kush in modern-day Sudan has far more pyramids than Egypt has. The sands of the desert now cover what was once a thriving civilization. And in a very rare article in 2008, National Geographic magazine published a well-detailed study on the black pharaohs of the Sudan who ruled the 25th dynasty of Egypt in the 8th century BC. But the Sudan has been ignored in modern history books with the belief that black Africans do not have neither the technology and intellectual ability to create a thriving and prosperous civilization without receiving some outside help. But recent scholarly research have refuted these claims and have shown that the oldest pharaonic dynasty was not in Egypt but in the Sudan and Egyptian culture was inherited from the blacks of the Nile Valley. The Washington Post in 1995 recorded that more than 5,000 years ago, black-skinned Africans began to create one of the most technologically and culturally sophisticated cultures that the ancient world had ever seen. It is known today as Nubia. This young man from the Sudan's dark skin was a phenomenon in the ancient world from those in the Orient in the East and the Occident in Europe in the West. One man commenting on a 7th century BC book said, Jeremiah the prophet asks, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? The prophet was as thoroughly aware that the Ethiopian was black as that the leopard had his spots. 2018 would make it 100 years since that statement from London's first black mayor was made. Two centuries after Jeremiah's statement, the 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus, when describing the people of the Sudan, said, The long-lived Ethiopians on the coast of the Indian Ocean, south of Libya. Their hair is the crispiest and curliest in the world. The natives are black because of the hot climate. This US cardiologist, Michael Mayamoto, is credited with photos of a CT scan in 2011. It is one of the most well-preserved mummies from ancient Egypt and dated to the 14th century BC in the 18th dynasty and found in the Valley of the Kings in tomb KV 36 in late March 1899. It is of a young man, a black African, by the name of Maya Herpy, which means Lion of the Battlefield. He was either an advisor, bodyguard, nobleman, warrior or courtier but his title Vambira to the king is a title usually held by the viceroy of Kush. His ears were pierced, he was uncircumcised, and his skin was missing on the soles of his feet. He had a dark ebony-hued complexion of his people of the Sudan, and his copy of the Book of the Dead confirmed that he was a dark-skinned Nubian. But the people of the Sudan were not all jet black. Like the people of Crete, they came in different shades, and wall paintings of Nubians of the Sudan dated to the 14th century BC shows black Africans with their ears pierced like Maya Herpy. Braided here, some are very dark skinned and others have a reddy brown hue skin tone. According to a very expensive book, Pediatric Skin of Color, 
In a section called Developmental Biology of Black Skin, he announced, Black Africans and their descendants in America, Caribbean and Latin America are under Fitzpatrick skin type 4 to 6. Doing research on the DNA of Black Sudanese has difficulties, so they do not just use DNA alone, but they check the craniofacial and mandibular on their body type to check how they are related to the people who live in the Nile of the day. Artifacts in the British Museum from ancient Greece show that Africans and Europeans had a deep respect for each other's differences, their complexions, texture of their hair, and the different size and shape of their lips and their noses. And even though we differ on the outside, underneath the skin, we are all the same. Many classify different groups as black and white, but nobody really are those two colors. We are all just different shades of brown. People of European descent are lighter skinned with more straight hair, and people of African descent are darker skinned with more curly hair. People from Southeast Asia have a very light brown skin, probably Fitzpatrick skin type 3, who have the longest, straightest, and fastest growing hair in the world. People in the Middle East, primarily in Iraq, vary between skin type 3 and skin type 4. And India, like Crete and ancient Kush, the people have different skin tones from skin type 2 to 6. But today, in our digital age, sadly, races are fighting each other over the complexion of each other's skin. How stupid. And they are making a big issue out of it. And countries like the United States, that loves to boast that it is a cultural melting pot, is instructed from the highest level in the government on what is the correct racial category each citizen should fit in and people are also using social media to hurt another person's race. The narrator gets it all the time, not phased in the least. You just have to feel sorry for them, they are very unhappy people. It's a reflection of that deep empty void in their hearts. In 1906, a book was published titled Folkways by a US socialist and it tells us where this mindset comes from. It is a word called ethnocentrism and this Episcopalian minister and Darwinist, a strange combination, said, Ethnocentrism is the technical name for the view of things in which one's own group is the centre of everything and all others are scaled and rated with reference to it. Each group nourishes its own pride and vanity, boasts itself superior, exalts its own divinities and looks with contempt on outsiders. Each group thinks its own folkways are the only right ones, and if it observes that other groups have other folkways, these excite its scorn. As man excavates the remains of his early forebears from the earth, he has come into the realization that early humans were not these ape-like beasts that he has portrayed us, but anatomical creatures that were compassionate and had the ability of speech. The oldest DNA of Neanderthals, the early inhabitants of Eurasia, confirms and shows that they were not this separate hybrid species, but Homo sapiens, just like us. The earliest human fossils in Africa prove that the first Homo sapiens looked like us, walked like us, and act like us. And Lucy, found in Ethiopia, was an anatomical human that walked upright. And the people of ancient China looked no different to their descendants who live there today, as more of their remains are being discovered and on earth. We shall find out more about early man and his DNA in an up and coming study called DNA.